Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And today I'm reviewing Imperium Classics, a game designed by Nigel Buckle and David Tershey from Osprey Games with art by the Micho. And this is actually part of a two-player two-game series. We have Imperium Classics and then we have Imperium Legends, both giving you eight different decks. You can mix and match the two sets. And this is, like I said already, I think I said already, I don't remember anymore, a deck-building game. A deck-building game of bringing your empire up through the ages, starting as barbarians, becoming more civilized as you go through different phases in the game. And it takes that classic deck-building concept, the genre, and it actually kind of mixes it up a fair amount. And there's a lot going on here, so let's try to explain everything, break it down one point at a time before we get into the whole review part. And to begin with, we're going to have our two players over here. We're set up for two players right now. You're going to have a full player area set up over here. This is going to be a main default card. We have the Persians and the Celts. We have the Persians over here. We have our Barbarian card, which will eventually turn into the Temple card or the Empire card once we flip that. We're going to have our starting deck over here. We're going to have a bunch of cards we'll be adding to our starting deck over here. And then we have our developments over here. And you're going to go through two different phases. In the, bar in the Barbarian phase, you're going to be adding these cards slowly to your deck. Once that is fully resolved, you'll instead start building out developments in the order of your choosing. So, like a typical deck building game, we're going to draw five cards, and we're going to go ahead and take actions. The actions are going to be defined by the various tokens over here. Each time you take an action, you can play a card, use up one of your action tokens. You're also going to have various tokens for exhaust effects as well. So, I'm going to go ahead and look at my cards, and let's say I'm going to go ahead and do this card over here. Ignore the small player area. We have Bactria where we're going to go ahead and gain three of that resource, the bricks. We're going to grab three bricks over here, and we're going to go ahead and add them, and then we're going to, uh, you may garrison a card. So we're going to go ahead and garrison a card. Garrisoning a card is going to involve taking a card from my hand and putting it under one of those cards. You know, I want to keep with the Zagros over here. I think I'm going to go ahead and garrison Prosperity. Prosperity rewards other players. You don't have to garrison a card. I'm choosing to garrison a card. We'll just put it over here. You're going to go ahead and take different actions. Maybe I take this action over here with Conquer. Now, Conquer has these, these uh, symbols on the side over here, which means I can only be playing this card while I'm still in the Barbarian phase. Contrast that with cards that have the Empire symbol. If we show you over here, we have the Empire symbol. So any card that has the Empire symbol can only be played during the Empire phase. So like I said already, you're building up your deck both for the now and for the future in this game. So we're going to go ahead and do the Conquer effect. We're going to pay two of that resource to acquire one of these two card types from the general card row. We're going to have different card rows over here, three specific areas which are going to have specific cards coming from specific decks, as well as a generally shuffled deck that's going to give us a whole variety of all these different four card types showing up over here with two cards at a time. So we're going to go ahead and acquire a card, or we can pay three to break through. Breakthrough is going to be a fancy term that effectively means you find a specific card of a certain type, and you can potentially ignore some of the downsides, such as the unrest cards. Unrest cards will often clog your deck and have to be gotten rid of, but you can go ahead and break through to avoid those cards. You're going to basically be taking actions to slowly build out your deck. That's the general concept of this game. It's not that dissimilar from other deck builders, except in the wild branching pathways this game has, because... You start off with a unique civilization, and each civilization potentially comes with its own unique rules as well, combined with the unique cards, unique uh, strategies, but they often come with their own unique rules that sometimes break the game. You may have a civilization that starts in the Empire phase. You may have cards that add cards to the Unrest deck. You'll have a cards that break a variety of different setup and gameplay structure elements in the game, but from there you're going to be building out your starting deck both from your initial cards over here, as well as cards from the card row trying to decide what strategy you're pursuing, how you're going to develop it, and where, where you move forward. Because every time you go through your deck of cards, you're going to go ahead and going to be adding one card to your deck until you add that last card. The City of Persepolis over here is going to be added to my deck, at which point we'll move to the Empire phase. When we go to the Empire phase, every time we go through a deck of cards, we'll instead be picking one of these cards, paying the cost shown on the card, there's going to be various costs on the bottom, and then adding those cards to our deck. These are going to be different cards that will, again, augment our strategy and the way we move forward in this game. Rinse and repeat until you basically win the game, or until the game ends more specifically. There's going to be a variety of point scoring cards over here. This deck of cards over here, as well as the King of King cards, are going to be the bulk of points you get in the game, giving you abilities and giant chunks of points. You know, we have Awe Inspiring. Increase your hand size by one, plus it's worth seven points. You're going to have Triumphant. Cannot be played, cannot be garrisoned, so it's going to be clog your deck, but it's worth 11 points. You have a variety of cards you can add to your deck for a large, large gaps of points, as well as the various cards you've developed throughout the game. Cards that can be potentially garrisoned, where they are off to the side and not clogging your deck. Cards that can go into your history, where they are permanently gone, because cards in your garrison are only temporarily gone. They can be shuffled back in through a variety of different effects, whereas cards going into history are permanently gone from the game, although they will still score their points for you, or negative points, at the end of the game. And that is effectively the shorter, condensed version of how you play Imperium. 
This game does have a solo mode. I have not played it, so I'm not going to go into it. It involves an AI player, but I haven't played the solo mode, so I'm not going to be talking about that past telling you that it exists. And from what I hear, it's supposedly pretty good. Which brings us to the things that I like and don't like about Imperium. And to begin with, off the bat, is going to be the art. I love anything that the Mitchell draws, any game he's has from Valeria to all the other games that I can't remember right now, to Endless Winter, to Merchant's Cove, anything he touches, I generally appreciate the art style he brings, and this is no different. Imperium Classics, Imperium Legends is going to have its traditional flavor artwork, which is excellent. It adds to the story this game is developing, and more specifically, because you have different decks, different empires, each one brings their own slight favor, that flavor that he manages to evoke in the artwork. Additionally, the pathways this game has, the pathways to victory are incredibly all over the place. They're, they're going to have to be in with the basic idea of just how you move forward in this game, whether you're building up these cards, whether you're going for these purple point scoring cards, or how you build your civilization, the order in which you build your civilization, the order in which you choose to build any of these development cards to try to help you win, which particular civilization you choose, with 16 different civilizations, each with slight nuances into how they play and what their deck is like, again, it provides tons of different pathways or strategies as far as how you can actually build your deck, drive the end game, win at this game, Imperium gives you a ton of different ways you can build things up. Additionally, the game is doing something different in the way it approaches deck building. Reading the rules is going to be a bit overwhelming at first, but once you actually get into the flow of how things work, the game brings a very different feel to the deck building concept. You have the general idea of a starting deck. You have the general idea of a card row, but that is effectively where the similarities end. It attempts to bring a different approach to the deck building genre and the way you build your deck and the way you develop your deck and the combination of developing your deck from your own unique civilization pool as well as a common pool of cards and the action system that it does to drive that engine forward. And that's where we're going to start moving to the things I don't like as well because the first thing I don't like is going to be the thing I just told you I do like which is it's doing something different. For all the fact that I appreciate the fact that Imperium will stand out in a crowd, Imperium will feel like a different game, and I like the fact that it's kind of breaking the deck building genre with a lot of things that it's doing, it also takes a lot of familiar concepts and makes them unnecessarily complicated just through the fact that it's trying to be different. Concepts like garrisoning a card where there's this weird hybrid of weeding your deck and not weeding your deck, and then you have your history, there's going to be terms, and breaking through, the concept of breaking through, which is a fancy way of saying add a card to your deck, but there's two ways to add a card to your deck. You can add a typical card with the potential resources it has in it, as well as taking the unrest card, or you can break through driving for a specific card type, potentially through this special deck over here, which can be a mix of different card types. All the breaking through, all the aspects like garrisoning and breaking through are going to be standard ways of dealing with deck building, where Imperium tries to be slightly different in a way that makes the game unnecessarily complex by making minor adjustments to co familiar concepts such as adding a card to your deck or weeding a card from your deck. So it's going to be a little bit of a both what I like and don't like in the concept and the aspect that Imperium is being different. The rulebook is terrible. Absolutely terrible. Now, I'm not even talking about the solo rules. From what I, from what I understand, the solo rules have game-breaking concepts missing from the rules, which you need the errata for, or the game is going to be straight up broken. But I'm talking about the basic rules, which reads like, it reads like an incredibly clinical manual trying to introduce things. It, it does the job. Don't get me wrong. It does the job. If you go through it, it is precise, it is accurate, but it reads like a technical manual with no concepts of how to actually play the game. To learn the game, you kind of have to just go through the game a few times, and once you're halfway through the first game, you're like, okay, I kind of get what's going on now. But the way I went through that first game is literally by reading the rulebook. Let's go ahead and grab the rulebook. Literally, and it's not long, by the way. It's just it's just unnecessarily dry for something that is attempting to be different. I literally read the setup step by step, putting out every single card, which is standard for setup. The setup is not that bad, actually. But then once you get into the rule section, it's literally like reading like a little flowchart of, okay, I can activate, innovate, or revolt. Okay, let's go ahead. Let's try those different actions one at a time. It's going through a step by step sequence of how those play out because the rulebook is incredibly dry in the way in which it approaches this game. And that's hard for a game that's trying to be different at the same time. You can read through the entire rule set and understand technically what you're doing without understanding what you're doing until you play through it and get halfway through your first game where it starts to slowly make sense. This engine you're building just because of the structure it has. It has a structure where you're like, okay, when you're drawing your deck, when you're done drawing your deck, put a token over here. If you don't have a token here, add that card to your deck. If you do have a token there, then you can't add the card to the deck. It's going through this whole step-by-step -step sequence of how everything plays out in a way that I find unnecessarily complex and out of alignment with how difficult the game is. Once you get that first game out of the way, the game is actually not that hard. I just think that there we have a, a game that's trying to be different and then a rule book that doesn't recognize that the game is trying to be different and instead is very dry 
and precise in what it's doing. It could have benefited from a, a few turns of play as an example, would have potentially given you more of a grasp. The rulebook was definitely a barrier to entry that I did not appreciate in this game. And speaking of barrier to entry, the barrier to entry across the board is going to be there. That rulebook, the rules, the differences, as well as just the building up your engine. It's going to take a decent amount of time before you can start building up those resources. You go through the first half of the game kind of just going through a flow, and more specifically, the barrier to entry is a little too high in contrast with what the game is bringing to the table, more specifically those fun moments in this game. While this game might have impactful fun moments for yourself, for myself it was it was really just a whole lot of action sequencing and a whole lot of trying to struggle through the rules and a whole lot of trying different pathways, different strategies, also, you could have minute adjustments of getting this card versus that card and getting that card. It didn't, it never felt like there was a fun aspect going on in this game. The game felt like it was trying so hard to be clever that it forgot to make the game fun, which might be a bit of a clue to how I feel about this game. And it doesn't help, by the way. It doesn't help that these tokens all look incredibly dry and contrasted with the amazing art that the Mitro brings to the table. As far as I can see, others not liking, the cards can be potentially overwhelming and the setup can be overwhelming. Those specifically, I'm not touching by myself because the setup, once you get your first game done, you literally have to go through step by step. But once you have your first game done, that setup is pretty quick and streamlined. It's a lot going on in the way you're laying out like six different aspects. Your starting civilization has six different cards situations you have to build. You have to have your starting card, your, your city over here, your cards like cross across your city, your development cards, your deck, and then your barbarian state. There's a whole bunch of aspects going on there, but once you get that moving, it does make a lot more sense, even just the second game already. And then past that, the cards have a lot going on on them. The cards can be overwhelming just in the sheer amount of text that is going on and the options it gives you. The cards do give you options. They'll have do this or do that or take this or garrison that or draw this. A lot of different things going on in the cards. And then the cards are messy as well. If you look through any individual card, if you look at this card over here, we have these symbols over here, which tell you which phase you can play it in. We have this symbol over here, which tells you both the civilization as well as the icon on that tells you what type of card within that civilization. We have the points over here, possible symbols over here, and then the abilities over here. These cards are incredibly busy, although the rulebook, to its credit, does do a good job breaking down which each symbol means in the game. We haven't even talked about the color banner or the various icons over there. Whole bunch of things. Some cards stay in play. They have an infinity symbol. Lots of different things going on in the cards, but they all kind of work. As far as my final thoughts on Imperium Classics, this is not a game that I want to play again. I recognize and think that this game is doing something well, and if you look at general ratings of this game, a lot of people appreciate this game, which puts it in a similar category as other games that I have, well, let's give my rating. My rating for this game is going to be a 2 out of 5. My rating system is going to be 1s are bad games, 2s are games that are not for me that I don't want to play again for one reason or another. 3s are good games, 4s are great games, and 5s are, well, the very best games that I do not want to leave my collection in any way, shape, or form. A 2 out of 5 for me generally falls into one of two categories. Either it's a game that I theoretically like, but I have too many complaints or problems about it that make it so that I don't want to play it. But another category of twos, the one that I would say Imperium Classics finds itself in, is the category of games that don't speak to me, to my playstyle, to what I want out of a game. And this would say, I would say this falls very much in alignment with games like Pipeline, with games like Cusco, other games that I have rated a two, because they are so dry in what they are doing. And the game spends so much time focusing on how you do things, and the clever intricacies. And there is strategy to be had here, there's a lot of strategy to be had. But this game reminds me of a conversation I once had with Jeremy Howard, which is interesting because I believe Jeremy Howard likes this game, but it reminds me of a conversation I once had with Jeremy Howard about what makes a game fun. For me, Imperium Classics is a game that is incredibly clever, but it's incredibly clever while being incredibly dry. There are no moments in this game that I found rewarding. The process worked, the deck building worked, the strategies to victory, all of those things work. But there was not a single moment in this game that I found rewarding, that I found fun, that I found impactful. There were no cards that made me go, I'm so glad I built out that card and developed got that card. There were all minor, minor variations of how you're going to get this resource versus that resource, or perhaps gather that card, or perhaps put that card into history. There's a lot of strategy, a lot of nuance, but nothing in this game that is fun for myself and what I look for in games. This is a bit of a harsh review, because it's not fun for me and I don't want to play this game again. But at the same time, I believe there is an audience for this game, people who like the intricacies and nuance and depth of strategy and don't mind the fact that you're doing all those things for minor variations of getting an extra resource here or an extra card there to win the game. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, have a good one.